Well, um, I'd like to start out by just pointing out I've answered my question now, so I don't need to answer any more questions. And in fact, as uh, one of the uh, fellow geeks up here, it was a policy question that I answered. So I think that I get a gold star for that one. Um, one of the perhaps unenviable uh, traits of being the last person that you hear present means that I run the risk that you've heard everything that I was going to say before and that my slides are now um, irrelevant. Um, a little like Sagnick, I feel like, you know, what's up here isn't necessarily what I need to talk about anymore. And so we'll, we'll touch on a few things here because I think that we need to. Um, I also usually don't start off with a personal story, but I am going to today. Um, uh, one of the things that I think is interesting is that I feel that maybe healthcare has matured a little bit and that nowhere today did I hear anybody compare healthcare to the banking system. And I'm glad that nobody said credit card transactions, nobody said ATMs, and if somebody did say it while I was out of the room for a minute, please give me my fantasy that nobody did. Um, instead, Dr. Clancy compared it to the travel industry. And that's where my story is, too, and I think that it's interesting that we are now comparing ourselves to really uh, the travel industry. Um, so yesterday morning, I had a commitment with the Medicaid department in Sacramento, which meant that I had to travel pretty late yesterday. I was getting on a plane at 4.30 in the afternoon out of San Francisco to come here. It meant that the plane was going to land uh, here at Dulles uh, between uh, 12.30 and 1 o'clock in the morning. And because I do believe that any self-respecting uh, Uber or Lyft driver should be comfortably in bed at that time, I was unwilling to uh, really uh, d rely on the final leg of my journey to be um, on, on Uber or Lyft. So what did I do? I reached out and scheduled that last leg with a uh, large entity with nationwide presence. I scheduled a shared ride van. Um, so I went to their website. I did um, uh, self-driven uh, scheduling. Yes, a little closer to uh, open table than to heart surgery. But at least there was some interoperability involved there because I said, well, this is where I'm coming in. This is where I want to go. And where I want to go was the Hampton Inn in Washington. Oh, you probably mean the one on uh, near the convention center. Yes, that's where I want. I didn't have to give an, an address. Uh, I'm coming from San Francisco. I'm arriving at uh, 1240 uh, in the morning. Oh, so it's United Flight, blah, blah, blah. That's the one you're talking about, right? And so while I'm going through the and then I put in my credit card, and yes, your credit card is authorized. So that means that in the background here, there's been a lot of interoperability going on. I'm sure that that vendor doesn't know every single flight that's going on. They reached out and got a flight schedule and could figure out what flight I was likely on. They don't keep every address in the entire world in their database, but they reached out to some service to do that. And they um, clearly reached out to some service, yes, I'm going to say credit card transaction, but anyway, to make sure that I actually could charge this. Okay, so I then land. I turn my phone off of uh, 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 airport mode, and there's a nice text message waiting for me from them saying, welcome to Dulles. Glad to see that you've landed. Click on this uh, link and check in. And says, so are you off the plane? Do you have all your luggage? Yes, I do. Go out door six, turn right, and wait at um, 2G area for the van to arrive. You are guest number 385. And we will send you another text message when uh, we have a van for you. So I'm in the happy place, and if you think back, of Dr. Kaiser's uh, uh, bridge up here. I am on the access side of the bridge. I'm a happy camper. All of this magic interoperability has happened in my scheduling of this event. I am oblivious to it all except that it magically happened. And I am in my happy space. We'll cross the bridge a little later. So rather today, rather than um, uh, talk about math, uh, as the last speaker of the day, I've decided to read legislation to you. Um, and it's not because I'm enamored with legislation, but I would claim that uh, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act probably did more to form what was going on in uh, EHR adoption and even the functionality and what EHRs look like um, than anything else that's gone on in that space. 
and that the 21st Century Cures Act has the potential for forming what happens in the interoperability space. And I'm not putting any judgment about whether ARA did good things or bad things to EHR adoption or whether the 21st Century Cures Act will do good things or bad things for interoperability, but I do think that some of the things that are there um, are going to be important to us and are worth paying attention to. Um, I'm also going to point out that there must be some insecurity in the interoperability space because I yet again am going to define interoperability for everybody a little bit differently, but I'd say that most of us are really agreeing that it, it contains the same things. Um, in uh, Title IV, Section 4003, see, I even know those by heart. That's really scary. Um, the Cures Act defines interoperability, at least uh, the, the legal definition that they're putting forward. And I think that there are some really important things uh, to draw out of this, and I actually kind of like the definition that emerges. And it's really about the secure exchange and use, which is important, um, of electronic health information without special effort on the part of the user. And it's that last piece there that you saw in my scheduling of my ride, is that I didn't have to go out and look up my flight number. I didn't have to go out and look up the address for the hotel. It was easy for me to go through this event and interoperability happened without me switching portals to do any of that. Okay, and so I think that's a really important piece of that. Um, one of the other uh, important pieces of the definition in the Cures Act is down here at the bottom, it does not constitute information blocking. And information blocking is kind of the big buzz right now, and we're not going to go deep into information blocking, but there are a couple of important things that are part of that too. So if I take the last slide and this slide, and I grab out of it some of the things that I think are important, I don't think that that's a bad definition of what interoperability is, that we're talking about the complete, secure, access, exchange, and use of all electronically accessible health information without special effort on the part of the user. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not out of a job. It may be hard for us as technologists, but it should not be hard for the users. So I don't think that's a bad uh, definition. If we go back to what Joe was talking about, you might claim that access is kind of uh, level one, that exchange is perhaps level two or level three maturity, that use is definitely three or four, that you need to have uh, good information to get there. So I'd, I'd say that some of those components are in that definition as well. Now we are going to touch on information blocking for just a second because I do think it's important. And there are a couple of things that happened as part of the definition of information blocking. And that's in uh, section 4004, uh, the ONC rule is not defining information blocking that's already in law. The rule just uh, defines uh, exceptions to information blocking. So these things are all things that are in the law today. And really information blocking is about interfering with or preventing um, the access, exchange, and use of electronic health information. And that can be um, uh, on the part of a large number of people. Now, information blocking happened before, and it was all about HIE, uh, excuse me, HIT vendors. It's all health IT systems and the vendors of those systems. The law expanded that to include networks, exchanges, exchanges is probably health information exchanges, the way you and I think about them, and providers, that none of those entities can be guilty of preventing the exchange of information. And when can they not do it? Well. Any time where authorized access, exchange, or use should be possible. Can't restrict that. So we're really talking about that the law is moving us forward. I'm going to move away from some of that other stuff. It's moving us forward to making it not only easy to be interoperable, and that's one of the requirements here, easy on the part of the user, but that HIT developers, exchanges, networks, and providers cannot discourage or restrict authorized access or impede innovations and advancements. And that's kind of my definition of interoperability based on the 21st Century Cures Act or legislation. And so I think there really are a lot of important things in there for us to, to, to bear in mind. Again, I don't think it really is different than the, the other definitions that we've uh, ha, uh, been talking about here. But I do think that you know there's 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 some useful f food for thought. Okay, now I I won't talk about legislation anymore. Um, 
in theory, I'm supposed to be talking about information exchange and really what health information exchange, what that perspective is, is bringing to the table. So I'm going to lift things up a little bit. We're going to talk a little less about specific systems, but we're going to talk about the concept of moving information around. And I can't do that just because of where I live without think, talking uh, about it a little bit in the context of California. Now, you can claim that California has done some good things and some bad things, and there are plenty of bad things that have happened in the health information exchange space, uh, and it's a strange animal today. There isn't a single statewide HIE as there are in many states, and in fact, depending on how you count, there's 15 or 18 different regional exchanges, all with slightly different capabilities. But the interesting thing about that is that it provides an interesting ecosystem to explore about what's going on in the industry. As I said before, all of those exchanges have headed towards an opt-out model for policy. They also have very common uh, types of data that they move around, common uh, types of participants in the exchanges. And I think that there's something that we can learn from that ecosystem that while I'm not saying that the VA needs to join le uh, regional HIEs, I think that there are things to learn if interoperability is a goal. So first of all, <clears throat> what is health information exchange? And one of my members pointed out to me that the whole idea of thinking about it as technology is really doing a disservice. That what HIE is probably more than anything else is some trusted forum for stakeholders to get together and try to figure out collectively how to fix a problem facing healthcare that might be fixed with data. And so you actually do see this happen as part of the governance or other mechanisms of an HIE is that you get public health and clinicians and county officials and sometimes patient advocates and payers and you get them all in the same room and say, you know, we don't know why the admission rate, the readmission rate is so high. We don't know why physicians aren't finding out about what's going on. Let's fix this with data. And so it becomes uh, the, the form in which that happens. And what I would claim is that we're really not even talking about exchange. We're again talking about access, exchange and use, and somewhere on that continuum that information is moving or being accessed or being used to solve the problem at hand. And that there is also utility in the maturity of moving from level one to level two to level three to level four. Some data is often better than no data at all. So let's talk a little bit about what is going on in California. Again, I think that there are some interesting things here that, that um, uh, might come out of that. Uh, first is um, who's, who's, who's uh, participating in health information exchange. These are going to be the organizations that think it's important for them to get data because they're opening up their pocketbooks. They're paying money to be part of this system. And therefore, it, it has returned. So you'd expect to see hospitals at the top of the list, but second on the list are county health departments, which you might not have expected. The primary care and specialists are way high on the list. As you boil on down, EMS, emergency medical services, surprisingly high on the list given that it's a completely different setting that, that is, is going on with them. And then you get to this, I don't know, bad place in the middle where long-term care is just getting on board, but is starting to get there as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a huge variety of stakeholders here. Perhaps what's more interesting is the type of information that they're moving around. What surprised me with this is where ADTs are on the list, that they're right up there at the top because we've been talking about all day. It's those messages that give you insight into what's going on with your patients, where they have been seen, where they've had encounters, where they're getting dismissed from encounters, where they're getting transitions, where they're getting transfers, et cetera, and gives you awareness of what's going on. But it is high on the list, and in fact, in some uh, very recently um, uh, being approved uh, uh, 9010 funding through CMS for onboarding additional providers into health information exchange in California, um, nobody gets funded if ADTs aren't the first thing that they do. So I think that there is real value in understanding what's going on there. Again, from a scheduling standpoint, it's giving you insight into what's going on with your patient, where they're being seen, where, the, where those en encounters are happening. Um, I won't talk about fire because you guys are going to talk about fire tomorrow. But so fire. Um, um, <laughs> What I would say, and I can't remember if it was Chris or John that uh, mentioned uh, fire being in ONC's uh, uh, 
uh, proposed rule. I think perhaps even more exciting than it being there is that it's in CMS's proposed rule for the disclosure of health information to um, members of managed care organizations, excuse me, uh, Medicaid, Medicare Advantage, um, Medicaid fee for service, managed care organizations, CHIP fee for service, et cetera, et cetera. The organization, the payers that um, uh, CMS has regulatory authority over are now required to give that information using FIRE um, to, to their members. And even if their member asks for it, have to reach out to the other organizations and collect it for that patient and bundle it up. It also requires that eligible hospitals all start sending around ADTs. So that rule has some really interesting implications. And I said I wasn't going to talk about regulation, but I um, couldn't help myself. Um, the other thing that's uh, uh, becoming more and more clear is that HIE is starting to get into uh, social services, social determinants of health, moving information other than just strictly clinical information. You talk about uh, policy issues for privacy and exchanging this information. It starts to really get dif difficult. I am, uh, I, I've run across, for instance, one organization where effectively the food bank became a covered entity in order to be able to receive information from a provider asking for help for a patient and getting the right kind of food. This is, this is a difficult area, but there's a lot of interest in it today, to the point that there's even a new term that people are throwing around as community information exchanges, not necessarily separate, though, from what's going on in HIE. Um, the one last thing I will say about uh, FIRE here is, in addition to the Argonauts, I would uh, recommend that people watch what's going on with the Da Vinci Project. They're looking not only at what happens in the clinical stakeholders, but in this case payers as well, and looking at a, a number of different transactions, including those that are called out in um, CMS's proposed rule. Um, we'll skip that. A uh, few other things to watch. I think I probably touched on all of these. Um, we talked a little bit about the proposed rules. We talked about the broader scope for information blocking and the Da Vinci Project. So I, I just think that those are some, some, some good things to be, to be asking about. Now, it's 1.30 in the morning. I've been in my happy place now, standing on the curb outside of Dulles Airport for about 15 minutes. And I'm still looking at my phone. My phone hasn't given me a, a band number yet. Okay, well, I'm a techie. I know that these things sometimes break. And so the connection between my phone and Verizon may not be good enough to carry the information. So what do I do? I go over to my reservation. I click on the phone number and call up dispatch and say, so can you tell me what's going on? When would I expect a van here? And they immediately could find my reservation, which is a good thing. I didn't give them a reservation number. Um, I told them what airport I was at and what my last name was, and they knew what was going on. And he says, I'm sorry, Mr. Cothran. Um, it's probably going to be an hour and a half before your van gets there. So now I'm on the other side of the bridge looking at coordination. And what, what I came to learn is that although the scheduling process was highly interoperable, the coordination side of it was not. Okay? Both of the vans that were at the airport left five minutes before I checked in because they actually they knew what flight I was on but weren't bothering to monitor when the flight arrived. So they left without me. Both fans did, stranding not only me but the guy standing next to me that had been there longer than I had. And uh, what I found very disturbing about the entire experience is the simplest thing for me to do was to get a refund. So this must happen all the time. So. What we're seeing, at least in this case, is a really good success on the scheduling side and then the ball dropped on the coordination side. So I think that that's something that we can't forget about. And we've said a bunch of different times here that we need to be thinking about workflow. There's an example of workflow. I'd also, I'm not going to suggest, <clears throat> so by the way, so I canceled my reservation. Seven minutes later, I'm in the back seat of a lift. Uh, I'm here today. Uh, I didn't have to visit the emergency department in the meantime, so a Lyft driver that picks me up at uh, quarter to two in the morning is still safe. Um, well, at least safe enough. Um, and I got to where I needed to go, um, not relying 
on a large organization with a highly interoperable scheduling system. And it was one of the early discussions that we had this morning that I just want to have people think about for a second, where somebody asked, and I don't remember who it is, and I apologize for that, but somebody asked the question, wouldn't it be better if we didn't need scheduling? And what would that life look like? What would that world look like? Well, I'd say... Yeah, it, it, it is, and, and I would not say that every provider needs to go out and become a Lyft driver. That's not what I'm saying at all, but that there are things that we can still learn uh, from in the industry, maybe even the travel industry, um, that might uh, apply in our space as well. And I think that we should be thinking um, differently about where we end up needing to go because there are some things we could learn. There you go. Fantastic. Any questions for Robert? Please. I am curious about this panel's perspectives on the idea of interoperability. And I like, um, Robert, what you mentioned about the, the subsequent workflow that has to happen um, as it relates to our discussions of a resource-based scheduling system. So I am going to use the context and the example of telehealth. So if you're sick of hearing, <laughs> plug your ears. Um, but at VA, it's, it's complicated because we do so much of it. It could be synchronous. It could be asynchronous. It could be from one region of the country, one facility within that region, to a whole other facility and a whole other region. And then within that facility, a different room, a different piece of equipment. You have to make sure that equipment is functioning. In still in that same room, you have to make sure that it has been IT approved in the year that it needs to be approved, and you have a memorandum of understanding and a telehealth services agreement, and a, a person, if that equipment needs to be operated by a human, in the case of a teleretinal imager or a teledermatology imager, that will be able to be present at that time using that machine in that room. So it's complicated. Is FIA going to solve that? So John will tell you the answer to that question tomorrow. Okay. But one of the things that I would say is that part of the down of, so the, the, I would claim that the job of a standards development organization is to boil the ocean, to come up with enough flexibility that they can describe anything that can possibly happen. And if there is one thing that fire suffers from, it is a great deal of complexity. But the reason is so that it can address a huge broad number of concerns, that it allows you to talk about the device in a room and where that device is located. It allows you to talk about contracts. It allows you to talk about availability. Now, have we figured that all out, how to make it work with workflow? No, not at all. But we're starting to talk about some of the tools. At least, I think we're starting to talk about some of the tools. John nodded once. I'll take that. That's good enough. Yeah. And I'm going to hold you to what you said on one of your slides, is that it, if it's going to work, it has to be, it has to not break the end user's back, right? right? It has to be seamless for the end user. Because right now, we're having a lot of human input yep. into putting in these resources and making sure they're being updated. And it's a lot of effort. So it does not feel automated. You don't have to hold me to yep. that. Congress said that. Yep. I didn't say that. It's also really? expensive. It's also expensive. Yeah. Isaac? Did you want to respond at all? I would actually answer pretty differently that I would a di pretty different answer to that question. I think that the job of interoperability is cross is cross organizational, uh, you know, semantics and tactical technical uh, data exchange and 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 kind of business like process ch exchange. Um, that all of those the hardest part of what you just described isn't about cross organizational. It's it's intra. That's inside an organization. Um, and that's and it's hard to manage resources. It's hard to manage resources in healthcare, particularly. And there's no interoperability technology that will change that. That's just the way it is. Uh, the, the, it's 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 whether you can offer your telehealth services with your you know for your specific um, specialty with your specific resources all lined up ahead of time. Um, and then and whether you can offer those internally, and then whether you can offer those externally as well. That's where interoperability makes a difference. Eva. So I, I think that's something very interesting from this panel. I was thinking about with Robert's um, comments, and actually it comes back all the time. So if we look at scheduling, we automate everything right now. What is the fallback system? Right, That is actually, like in our field, we call survivability network. So if a system fails, mm -hmm. you fall back and you basically 
do not even notice anything happen, right? Because you just basically switch from one system to the another. But I think it would be very interesting if we automate everything with the scheduling. What are we for? Like, like if something fails and there are glitches, like if it is just a, a car you wait for seven minutes or one and a half hour, but what is happening? What is going to happen will be like the reliance on the system will really make you think a lot harder about the survivability network of how do you, like, if something fails, how do you fall back and you still have that system functioning as if nothing in the back happens? I yeah. think that's going to be extraordinarily important when we actually automate a lot of these. And or, or the same question about clinical systems. Exactly. Yeah, right. Right. exactly. <laughs> yeah. and that's Harvard has... Yeah. Right? And Columbia exactly have the same problem too. Yeah. So I think that's something okay now we just have to work system. I would think that it would be nice when you develop a system to have some something to do with that. That's good. Sorry. Good point. It's on. Hello? Yeah. I think it's on. Hi, I'm Mia Powers taking the work for the Office of Veterans Access to Care. And Robert, I really uh, related to your story with the, the, the company with the ride share, because um, I've had something similar happen. Um, but when you talk about interoperability and the use and the need of still human interaction, how do you prepare a group of people for what's to come with interoperability? Because it sounds like sometimes there's a misunderstanding of what is really, it's supposed to really do. I think some people have an idea that it's going to take away the need for human interaction or the need for humans to even pay attention. Because even in that scenario, um, no one seemed to have picked up the fact that your flight got there, got there a little bit late. The scheduling system worked, but it didn't connect you to the right ride. So how do we educate or better prepare people for what really interoperability means, what their responsibility would be within that this new wave of how we operate and how to best react to it and respond. And you're looking at me, aren't you? <laughs> um, I, that's, I think that's a really good question, and I don't know that I have the right answer to it, but I can tell you what, at least on the HIE side of things, some of the organizations are doing. Um, I think that that may be a very different answer than you would get in the provider space directly, and so there may be some, some, some insights uh, from others as well. Um, Really what you're talking about is workflow redesign or something akin to it. You're talking about disrupting what's going on in the healthcare system now in order to do things better. Um, change is going to be somewhat disruptive. And so starting to think about what the picture should look like and then how data can support it is a better way to go than bringing a technology along and look at this cool information I'm moving and now what can you do with it. One thing I will say that California has learned more than once is that if you merely bring data exchange, um, they won't come. And that it has to solve a problem in a way that people can work with it. And so interoperability is only useful if it supports a desired workflow and solves a problem. Here, here. Amen. Yeah.